a millionaire couple gunned down in their living room. This was by far the bloodiest scene I'd ever seen. You wouldn't expect something of this magnitude to happen anywhere, let alone a, a small community like Hanford. A small town gripped in terror. Do we have a bunch of nuts running around in here just shooting people? Once I slept with one eye open and when I closed, I don't know when I ever slept again. And a disturbing new breed of evil. I could not find any sense of sorrow for what they did. The richest farmlands in the world are growing something rotten. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Five days before Christmas in California's San Joaquin Valley, when 21-year-old college student Tiffany Yoakum makes a horrifying discovery on the family farm. Good evening, Kings County. Yeah, I've got a little girl here. She says the house has been broken into. Her parents are hurt bad. She's all shook up. Her parents are hurt bad. Her parents were hurt? That's what she's telling us. Officers raced to the Yoakum residence in the farming community of Hanford. It's a rural area. It's out in the middle of nowhere. So the nearest, those homes are probably anywhere from half a mile to a mile apart. So you're pretty much out in the middle of the fields. Inside, a gruesome scene. There was a lady sitting in a chair with the majority of her head had been blown off and your husband laying on his back on the floor and a lot of blood coming out of his head. The victims are 58-year-old Ray Yoakum and his wife Gail, a wealthy and well-known couple. When I was in the military, I was in the medical field, so I dealt a lot with blood. This was by far the bloodiest scene I'd ever seen. It appears Gail was shot first. She was just sitting there reading the paper, enjoying life. She was in her kimono and never knew what happened. It was fired from the kitchen, threw a Tiffany lamp, and struck her in the head. Detectives suspect that her husband, Ray, was sitting at a nearby table when the sound of gunfire startled him. It looked like uh, when the shot went off, uh, being as loud as it would have been, that uh, he jumped up, knocked the table over, um, the coffee cup was on the, on the ground. He was shot in the head, the chest, and multiple times in the arms. It had to be somebody who definitely did not like the Yoakums. You could see a murder like this happening on the mean streets of South Central L.A., not amidst the rolling farmlands of Central California. So much for the safety of pastoral living. We found two shell cases under the breakfast bar and one in the garbage disposal on a carrot, believe it or not. Ray's injuries seem consistent with a 22 caliber automatic rifle. But Gail's wounds had to have come from a larger weapon. That gun did a tremendous amount of, of damage when you wouldn't expect to see that from a 22. To detectives, two guns means two killers. So far, they've done a good job of covering their tracks. It makes it even more frustrating because you're looking at someone who is taking the time after they kill someone to try to clean the crime scene up. The only fingerprints in the house belong to the victims, their daughter Tiffany, and their 18-year-old son Kevin, who lives on the other side of town. The fingerprints that I was finding were those of the residents. I was rather upset with the fact that I found nothing in a rather large house. They just have no clue where to go from there. There's no sign of forced entry. Then again, in a place like Hanford, where neighbors trust their neighbors, it's not hard to get into anyone's house. Gail and Ray Yoakum 
as many people during that period of time, and especially out in the country, did not lock their doors. Apparently, murder wasn't the only thing on the killer's minds. Drawers had been pulled out, cupboards opened, papers and all kinds of things on the floor, and it appeared that someone was looking for something in the house. It could have been just a botched robbery. So I'd actually been at the house before investigating burglaries. The burglaries were of some minute things like jewelry, a necklace or a bracelet, watch, rings, things like that. Deputies question the neighbors, but the farms in the area are so far apart, nobody saw or heard anything. The whole family was just in shock that we didn't really know what to think. Tiffany tells police her dad was watching TV and her mom was knitting when she left the house around 7 p.m. Three hours later, she would find her parents beyond help. Tiffany didn't have a clue who did this. I talked to Tiffany a little bit that night when she was here. She was just real quiet, real numb, you know, crying. She, just, she was at a loss. Investigators have to wonder if the Yokums were targeted because of their wealth. Between all of Ray's relatives, the family holdings were worth around $18 million. They also owned a bar in Hanford, two restaurants in Morro Bay, and several rental properties. We got a little spook. We made a lot of money and it was popular and we knew everybody. Ray and Gail were multimillionaires in their own right. Their 600 acre farm alone was worth over four million dollars. They were considered to be wealthy in the community there. They attended lots of the more uh, affluent activities that were there. In Hanford, California, there's a vast disparity between the rich people who own the land and the poor people who work it. it could be a disgruntled worker. You really don't know what, you know, you just, you just guess them. But there are whispers of an even darker motive. There was some type of devil worship or devil cultist type stuff going on in the community that might have led to something like this happening. Am I safe in my house or we have somebody running around the county here that's just arbitrarily picking out people and shooting them? As the story goes public, people throughout the valley are locking their doors for the first time and going to bed with their rifles. It was just unprecedented. People were truly shocked at the scope of it and the heinousness of the crime. Hanford, you know, was a quiet ag town. There wasn't much in Hanford. There was an old movie theater that you could go to, but mostly everything was the Friday night basketball games, football games. It's just a close community. Everybody grew up with everybody. Everybody's lived on the same ranch for 30, 40 years, so everybody knows everybody, and almost everybody's good friends. That, that such wonderful, prominent people like these could be gunned down in their own house makes you feel a little vulnerable where you live, especially if you're out in the country. But there's nothing law enforcement can do to calm people's fears. They don't have any suspects, any motive, or any leads. The Yoakums may have been the lords of their own fiefdom, but when you live on 600 acres, there's no one around to hear you scream. Something evil was lurking in the cotton fields of Hanford. Finding it would test the local police like never before. Just five days before Christmas, Ray and Gail Yoakum are slain in their Central Valley, California farmhouse. You wouldn't expect something of this magnitude to happen anywhere, let alone a small community like Hanford in the middle of California. The only items of evidence left at the scene are three 22 caliber rifle casings. These guys are pretty meticulous at what they're doing. I thought to myself, I hope we can solve this one. The autopsies place the time of death between 9.30 and 10 p.m. They also reveal the cold-blooded nature of the crime. 
whoever it was held a gun to Ray's head and just kept pulling the trigger. They wanted to make sure there was nothing left. 48 hours after the murders, with detectives still scrambling for a single lead, the Yoakum family hunkers down. We didn't know if somebody had it after the Yoakum or what was happening. The first thing we did do was we hired security guards. We hired them at our house, and my father-in-law hired them. I had a tri-D and all that, just getting in my own house. It was pretty scary at the time. I slept with one eye open, and when I closed, I don't know when I ever slept again. With Hanford's most prominent citizens living in terror, police are under enormous pressure to find the killers before they strike again. They go digging for clues in the Yoakum family history. Ray's father, Hadley Yoakum, was one of the valley's original settlers. He came from Oklahoma at the height of the Great Depression with only $10 in his pocket. Hadley Yoakum moved the family here to get a good start. He knew agriculture, and this is where they settled. For six years, Hadley and his four sons worked tirelessly in the cotton fields. My oldest brother, he picked seven, 800 pounds of cotton a day. Average person would pick maybe 400 pounds a day. So he was real good at it. I heard them say how tough times were and how it was hard to buy food and raise a family. And uh, all the boys worked and helped out. Finally, in 1942, they'd saved enough to buy an old house on 65 acres and started planting their own cotton. My dad kind of pushed them all, and they, they worked hard. There's a lot of families around here that didn't work as hard. Hadley began to rent property and then buy it, and pretty soon they had <laughs> uh, many acres. From the time he was a teenager, Ray was a meticulous and dedicated farmer. They say that Ray Yoakum drove the finest cotton furrows in all of King County, so perfectly level that the water stood in them like taut ribbons. If anybody could turn dirt into gold, it was Ray. The Yoakums were very prosperous and successful farmers, but they had done it the hard way. They had earned it. The Yoakums diversified, adding wheat and beans to the mix. Before long, the family was making money hand over fist. Working the land may have been a passion for Ray, but he and Gail also knew how to cut loose, and all their money let them cut loose in a big way. About every weekend, we'd have some, a lot of fun. Ray had a real fast Corvette. He dragged Ray's. And he had a speed boat, a ski boat, and it was a racing boat, too. Gail yeah, liked to play tennis. She used to play tennis just about every day, and they liked to snow ski. They had condominium. The Yokums rubbed elbows with the wealthiest and most influential people in the valley. They hobnobbed at swanky cocktail parties. They vacationed in the Greek Isles, but they never forgot their humble roots. Gail was active in both 4-H and PTA. She was a 4-H leader. She was an officer one year in PTA and belonged to a couple of clubs that benefited disabled children. With their empire continuing to expand, the Yoakum seemed like they had it all. But there was a bad egg down on the farm, and he was threatening to spoil everything the family had worked so hard to build. Before their untimely deaths, Ray and Gail Yoakum seemed to have it made. A flourishing farm a multi-million dollar fortune, and plenty of playtime. But as investigators find out, they had one big problem that money couldn't fix. Their teenage son, Kevin. If you look at Kevin, you'll see this uh, choir boy looking person, but he wasn't, he was troubled. Kevin was very quiet. When I would see him at school, he'd say hello, but his head was always down. I don't think he got into much trouble until he got a little bit older. As he's growing up, he's a good kid. And then he got 
Kind of the wrong crowd, I guess. While his older sister Tiffany was academically inclined and hardworking, Kevin was the opposite. He never got a real good job on the ranch. But the only thing Ray let him do is sweep, sweep the shop out and clean the shop up, clean, and the kid didn't like that. His father was a strong taskmaster. He just wanted his son to work hard, just as he had done and his family had done. Apparently, Kevin didn't inherit that gene. The little ingrate had no intention of breaking a sweat. He just wanted to feed off the family fortune, go to the beach, and party with his friends. The Yoakums tried everything to motivate their son. Family counseling, tough love, even bribery. His parents had bought him a new Trans Am. And, I mean, if you're a kid, back in those days, new Trans Am, that is everything. His father says you could pay for it by working on the ranch. Well, he missed work. He wouldn't do it. So what did the father do? He took the car away from him. Ray was a pretty tough guy. He was, uh, he was a stern father. And Kevin wasn't buying into it. Kevin said, if I can't if I have the car, nobody's going to have the car. Took a mallet, beat the hell out of it. Punctured the tires. That's the kind of problems that Ray was having with, with Kevin. At 15, Kevin moved out of the house and in with a series of different school friends. He and his parents barely spoke. He was probably looking to leave as much as mom and dad wanted him to leave. They just had a difficult time controlling him. I know Ray, right at the end, he was a little bit spooked of him. Kevin raised a big red flag when, you know I mean, we're wondering about him. Police haul Kevin in for questioning. He admits that he and his parents butted heads, but vehemently denies having anything to do with their murders. And as investigators soon discover, Kevin has an airtight alibi. Dozens of witnesses remember seeing him and Tiffany in town at the time of the murders. Kevin was with Tiffany at a Burger King in town. Tiffany had been trying to get Kevin and their parents to reconcile. Tiffany wanted to basically try to get him to come home for Christmas, try to get the family together. Kevin's not really going along with that. He didn't want to do it. With Kevin ruled out as a suspect, detectives are back to square one. Meanwhile, all of Hanford turns out for the Yoakum's funeral at the Lakeside Community Church. And this church was packed. Cars were parked uh, about a half a mile in every direction here. They knew their character. They knew their integrity. And uh, they loved Ray and Gail. And so they came in honor of them and their respect for them. It devastated my grandfather. You, know, you never want to bury a son or a child before you. you know, he was never well after that. Police set up a hotline and asked the public for help. Almost immediately, the calls start pouring in. It's a heavy load. So you just got to just put your nose to the, to the grindstone and start working. That's what we did. Most of the calls are purely speculative. You had people that were assuming that it was occultist type of uh, behavior or some type of robbery, but there was nothing that would substantiate any of that. But one anonymous tip stands out. The person called up and said that he had information on who did it. Actual names of people who were involved. The tipster tells police to take a closer look at local boys John Cox and Jamie Spanky. Spanky, a 17-year-old high school student, has a previous arrest for shooting his stepfather. He rang the doorbell, his stepfather came to the door, shot him five times. The stepfather survived. He escaped jail because the authorities said that he had been a victim of some kind of abuse. On the night the Yoakums were murdered, Jamie says he was hanging out with his girlfriend, and she tells police the same thing. So we asked Jamie and his girlfriend to come down and talk to us. Each one of them gave each other an alibi. They were together. We asked if they knew John Cox. Oh, yeah, we know John Cox, you know. 
Cox also had a reputation for trouble. Kind of a, a wild guy, a crazy guy that would do something crazy. He had told a teacher he wanted to be a hitman when he grew up. Cox was just cool as a cucumber. And Spanky was the same way. Done a lot of checking. And there are some people talking. Talk is bull. Okay. How do you know the person's not saying that? It's not trying to save their own act. Well, let's cross the line, too. But, uh, I think that we've got some pretty... I think we've got some pretty accurate information. Again, you might not. Because I didn't do it. I, mean, I don't care what anybody says. I couldn't walk into somebody's house and shoot them. That's not me. He had a tough guy image. If you don't fit in as a jock or a studious person, you know, you're a tough guy. Okay, that's his image. I got the impression that they knew more than they were saying, but how were we going to get it out of there? Police search Spanky's car, and what they find raises eyebrows. A spent 22 caliber shell casing. Ballistics experts compare it against the casings found at the crime scene. The marks are striations, which are left uh, on the side of the shell case. And in this case, uh, they were excellent, and I was able to just right away say that this was the gun. Oh, I was elated. I thought, well, now we're on the right road. Spanky has got to know something about this because the shell casing was in the back of his car. He's got some explaining to do. You'd think the teenage boys of Hanford would be drinking beer, tipping cows, and cruising for farm girls, not slaughtering people in their homes. What a charming picture into small town life. And things were only going to get more disturbing. After the shell casing from Jamie Spanky's car is found to match those from the Yoakum murder scene, detectives are certain the 17-year-old knows more than he's telling. It was just like, no, I didn't do it, you know, and I can't explain how that shell casing got there. Maybe somebody was in a car with it, fell out of their pocket, you know, I mean, he's trying to rationalize how it got there. Then he finally said he wanted to talk to his father. But before Mr. Spanky has a chance to meet with his son, Investigators employ a clever strategy. They lie and tell Jamie's father that his son has already confessed. Thinking he's got nothing to lose, Mr. Spanky tells police everything Jamie had already told him about his involvement in the crime. Basically what Jamie told you was that these girls going out there and they had a kid. There was an attack and he didn't come to you about it. And they did. But Jamie said he drove, drove both of them out there. Yeah. And that uh, the other kid was nervous and he was afraid he was going to ride on him. Yeah. As for motive, Spanky's father says that Jamie had gotten into heavy metal recently and believes the murders were part of a satanic ritual. I just heard about it. That they've got a place outside of town with some of them. And they go steal animals. Now, I was sick, sick when I heard that my own kid. Father walks in, and of course the interrogation room is wired, and I'm in the other room listening. The father walks in and tells Jamie that, uh, you know, they know everything. Uh, they told me that you told them everything. So I told them what you told me. Jamie's response was, you did what? What a blow. Sandbagged by your own dad. Now there was only one way out for young Jamie. He had to start talking. And he gave us a statement. Jamie basically told us how they did it. Jamie admits to driving John Cox and Cox's best friend, Mark Lawson, out to the Yoakum house the night before the murder. It's dark. It's quiet and quiet December night. Parks the car several hundred feet away. Mark Lawson, John Cox, 
Get out of the car. Cox and Lawson approached the house on foot, intent on killing the people inside. But a simple twist of fate would put their plans on hold for the night. When they got out there, Tiffany was in the house also. And just as the boys were about to enter, Tiffany locked the door, a habit she picked up in college. She didn't know they was on the other side. Saved her life. Spanky says he dropped Cox and Lawson back at the Yoakums the following night. While he drove home, they finished the job. They go down the street to the Yoakums home, where the Yoakums were in, in the house, like any other family. Ray was reading the newspaper. Gail was watching television. They burst in and shot him. After rifling through the family's belongings to make it look like a robbery, the boys planned to drive off in the Yoakum's car, but they couldn't find any keys. So they had to call Spanky to come back to pick them up. Marcus, all just jazzed up. I mean, just really excited. The adrenaline, you know, he's, we did it, we did it. We killed them both. Mrs. Yoka's brain's all over the house, all over the room. When Jamie doesn't believe them, Lawson holds up his gloves. And he had blood on the end of it, his fingertips. And Jamie goes, why did you call me up? Well, you're part of this. He took him back to John's house, and they proceeded to get rid of the guns and shell casings and everything. Spanky says that he, Cox, and Lawson then dumped the rifles in a canal 15 miles away. There was still a little bit of mud in the bottom, and they stuck the barrels in the mud and then took towels and wiped the guns down for fingerprints. Then they tossed them into a bush. Police raced to the scene and find three empty rifles exactly where Spanky said they would be and immediately have them test fired. In this case, we really were only interested in the shell cases. Those were put on the microscope and the extractor mark was just absolutely textbook. And it was very easy to, to make an identification. Jamie's horrible tale is bearing out, but there's still one piece of the puzzle missing, motive. What made a couple of teenagers go into a farmhouse and blow away a kindly middle-aged couple? Did the devil make them do it? Or was there something even more sinister going on? Jamie Spanky has told police what happened on the night of the Oakham double murder. Now investigators want to know why. Realizing he's cornered, Spanky agrees to come clean. Father told me to tell him the whole truth and try to, we'll try to get the best deal we can for you. And so at that point in time, the district attorney was there and he gave us a statement. Spanky drops a bombshell. The killers weren't Satanists. They were mercenaries hired for the job by none other than the Yoakum's son, Kevin. I had this real gut feeling that this has got to be the truth. Sure enough, police uncover a long-term relationship between Spanky and Yoakum. Jamie met Kevin first uh, in town, just in passing, you know. And uh, they started running around together. Jamie Spanky and Kevin were friends. In fact, I, I'm almost certain that Kevin had gone to live with Jamie Spanky for a while, so they developed a friendship. Later, they attended the same high school for students with discipline problems. That's where they met John Cox. Kevin was one of the rich farmer kids, and Spanky was just middle of the road, and of course, we were sort of poor, so you got the whole mix there. But according to Spanky, being a rich farmer kid wasn't enough for Kevin Yoakum. For years, he'd been spinning a fantasy about a life without his mom and dad. Kevin spoke of his strong hatred of his parents. He wanted his parents dead because he wanted the money. He wanted to live on the ranch, the good life, and 
party and have a good time. Kevin had the most to gain. Two and a half, two point three million dollars for an 18, 19 year old kid. Kevin Yoakum had selected Spanky because he knew Spanky had shot somebody prior to this. So he figured, oh, here's the guy I want. Well, when it got down to it, Spanky said he couldn't do it. Spanky tells detectives he had no intention of killing Yoakum's parents himself, but did suggest someone else for the job, John Cox. John Cox had a, a, a reputation. He wanted to be a hitman. He saw, saw himself as a tough guy. I really think everybody thought it was a joke when they first started talking about it, and somehow it just gathered a lot of momentum and grew into something that became very serious. For the right price, Spanky says, Cox was ready to kill. Kevin said, you know, I'll pay you $10,000 to go out and kill him. To John, John said, okay. They recruited Cox's best friend, Mark Lawson, to help with the killings for another 10 grand. Spanky would get $7,000 to drive them to the scene. I'm sure it was a lot of money to John and Mark and Spanky. Spanky, Cox, and Kevin could live out there. Things would be great. They wouldn't have to live with anybody's parents. Nobody would oversee them, all, all of them. Over a period of several weeks, the four Hanford teens discussed a variety of methods for killing the Yoakums before settling on a home invasion. Kevin even drew them a layout of the house. But now, just three days after the murder, their plot has come undone. Cops came from everywhere. Next thing I remember is they're dragging John out, laying him on the floor in the living room before they took him away. Police arrest Cox and Lawson, but both claim innocence and point the finger right back at their accuser, Jamie Spanky. There's got to be a scapegoat. Spanky's already shot somebody. Makes sense. He was the first one to talk. You know, point your finger somewhere else, right? Reasonable doubt. Investigators also obtain an arrest warrant for Kevin Yoakum. He was not a happy camper. His reaction was, you have the wrong person. When I heard Kevin was arrested, I was kind of, kind of shocked, but it's like you don't, you're, you're in disbelief. I hoped it wasn't true that, that he was involved. Detectives try to interrogate Kevin, but he lawyers up and refuses to answer any questions. He refused to talk to us. He advised him of his rights, said, no, I don't want to talk to you. It takes a special breed of monster to murder your parents. But when that monster is hidden in the guise of a tall, handsome, rich boy, justice is never a sure thing. As journalists from all over the state swoop in, it quickly becomes clear the little town of Hanford can no longer keep this story to itself. It just got crazier. I mean, at one point in time, the Fresno Bee sent five reports, and they talked to anybody and everybody. So we've always been kind of a quiet family, you know, low-key, and all of a sudden you're thrust into a you know, big old spotlight. 82-year-old Hadley Yoakum announces that the family is behind Kevin 100%. Tiffany is defiant in her support of her brother. Her initial reaction was total shock. Uh, we had the wrong person. Kevin wasn't involved. How dare you? I mean, she was really upset. Kevin has a very good side to him. He was very nice to a lot of people, made a lot of friends with people. There were a lot of people that just couldn't feel that Kevin could do something like this. From things that we saw, mostly heard, they had to have a reason to arrest him. But I think deep down inside, we were hoping he wasn't guilty. When I heard Kevin was arrested, it did kind of shock me. I had heard the rumors, but I was kind of open against it. But when Pastor Guy Harden visits Kevin Yoakum and John Cox in jail, he sees a far more menacing side of the suspects. Uh, I could not find any sense of sorrow for what they did. There was no remorse in Kevin's part, nor in the fellow who pulled the trigger. To prove that Kevin was gunning for his parents' inheritance, detectives obtain a copy of the Yoakum's will 
and have it tested for fresh prints. I found fragments of fingerprints, but the only usable print I found was on the back side of the page eight that spelled out what the children would receive if, in fact, Mr. and Mrs. Yoakum were to be deceased. The print belongs to none other than Kevin Yoakum. That man's Kevin read the will. He knew it was in the will. He knew what he was going to get. Assured that he hadn't been officially disowned, Kevin could now put his menacing plan into action. Three months after the murders, the DA starts preparing for trial. In a town like Hanford, where the most exciting thing to happen in 10 years was the John Denver concert, the Yoakum trial was shaping up to be a can't-miss event. A month after Ray and Gail Yoakum were gunned down in their home, confessed getaway driver, 17-year-old Jamie Spanky, pleads guilty to second-degree murder. He is sent to the California Youth Authority until the age of 25. John Cox was 18 years old on the day he committed the murders. That was his birthday. If he had been successful the night before, he'd have been a juvenile. Cox, Lawson, and Yoakum are all charged as adults with two counts of murder and conspiracy. And still, they don't show an inkling of remorse. When they walked into the court, they were all laughing, having a good, jolly good time, you know. They were clowning around and thought it was a real big joke, you know. Two people dead and they were laughing about it. The defendants are tried separately. Cox goes first. John Cox's defense rested on trying to discredit Jamie Spanky. Spanky was a proven shooter. He had shot his stepfather before. So they said uh, he was really the shooter and it wasn't uh, John Cox. But Spanky's candid testimony seems to lay that theory to rest and puts the blame back on the defendant. The John Cox trial was interesting from the standpoint that here is this kid, 18 years old, accused of a horrendous crime, sitting there with no emotion. Even when there was testimony against him by like Jamie Spanky. Cox is convicted of all charges and is sentenced to life in prison. He won't be eligible for parole until he is 94 years old. But when the verdict came down, he finally displayed some kind of, you know, that he was a, a, a human being. He buried his face in his hands and cried. If his goal was to become a hitman, and he succeeded. After Cox's conviction, his lackey, Mark Lawson, pleads guilty and agrees to testify against Kevin Yoakum. He said that Kevin wanted to do it, and John agreed to do it, and that John asked Mark if he would go with him and help him. He said, yes, he would. Mark was a follower, good guy, but didn't seem to have any ambition to do things on his own. He was fine just, you know, being Robin to John's Batman. Lawson tells detectives that Cox shot Gail Yoakum. But then his weapon jammed. The prosecution introduces the hunting rifle into evidence. You recognize that? Yes, the one John had. Ray started coming after him and John's backing up, yelling at Mark to shoot him, to shoot him. Lawson admits firing several rounds into Ray Yoka, knocking him to the ground. John told Mark to finish him off. Mark said, I can't do it. Can't do it. So John took the gun away from him and put it to Mr. Yoakum's head and emptied the gun. In exchange for his testimony, Lawson gets an eight-year sentence with the Youth Authority. Mark Lawson who killed Ray Yoakum is out on the streets at age 25. Under today's tougher laws, I think he'd still be in jail. 18 months after his parents' murders, Kevin Yoakum rejects an offer to plead guilty. His case is sent to trial. I said this is gonna be a hell of a case. You had the money, the inheritance. You have a, 
a son of a prominent, prominent couple. Hardworking family people. If the defense has an ace in the hole, it's Kevin's sister, Tiffany, his staunchest defender. She testified that she did not believe Kevin was involved in the murder of her parents. Her whole demeanor and everything in terms of her testimony indicated that she was supportive of Kevin. Then Kevin stuns the courtroom. Taking the stand in his own defense, he argued his three friends acted all on their own. He admits that they probably joked about it, but this is something they decided to do on their own. Hopefully then that Kevin would then, when he moved in the house, invite him to stay. He was on the stand under cross-examination for uh, probably about a day and a half. And uh, he just, matter of fact, didn't do it. Nope. He denied, 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 denied. Were you involved in this? Did you do this? Did you do that? No, no. The trial lasts for two months. After nine days of deliberation, the jury finds Kevin Yoakum guilty on the conspiracy and solicitation and sentences him to 26 years. But the jury deadlocks on the charge of first-degree murder. Kevin was disappointed at the verdict. Uh, however, he was, uh, he saw a ray of hope. But Kevin's luck may have just run out. Tiffany read an article in the paper that said he had considered killing his sister. And now, she's willing to work with police. Four months later, Kevin is back in court, retried for murder. But this time, it's his sister who takes center stage. The most dramatic moment in the trial happened when Tiffany took the stand. Once Kevin's strongest supporter, she was no longer her brother's keeper. After the parents were found, Kevin and Tiffany embraced and he was started crying and all this sort of stuff. She was asked on the witness stand if she thought that that was uh, an act. And her response at trial was, at the time, I didn't think so. But now, I believe it was an act. Tiffany's revelation makes a big difference. This time, the jury finds Kevin guilty of first-degree murder. Kevin was devastated when the verdict came down. I think he had convinced himself that he was going to, to beat these charges, and he just couldn't believe that a jury didn't see the case his way. Kevin is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And he wanted the money, and he didn't want to deal with his parents. He wanted to be able just to take the money and enjoy life. He didn't want his parents telling him what to do. If this hadn't happened, Ray would have made him a partner in probably a couple of years. Kevin was in a little bit too hurry, I guess, to get, get some money. The Yoakum Farm was of considerable acreage. Open space, big sky. He was free to come and go. All he had to do was, you know, behave. Now he's in a cell, no bigger than a closet. It doesn't matter whether you were raised in a penthouse or a farmhouse. A spoiled brat is a spoiled brat. Hopefully, a lifetime in men's prison will finally teach Kevin a lesson. For True TV, I'm Dominic Dunn. Got a little bit of gasoline. Welcome to another crime series.